The Mysterious Island by Jules Verne Part Three, Chapter Eleven Gideon Spillett took the box and opened it. It contained nearly two hundred grains of a white powder, a few particles of which he carried to his lips. The extreme bitterness of the substance precluded all doubt. It was certainly the precious extract of quinine, that pre-eminent antifebrile. This powder must be administered to Herbert without delay. How it came there might be discussed later. "'Some coffee,' said Spilett. In a few moments Ned brought a cup of the warm infusion. Gideon Spilett threw into it about eighteen grains of quinine, and they succeeded in making Herbert drink the mixture. There was still time, for the third attack of the malignant fever had not yet shown itself. How they longed to be able to add that it would not return! Besides, it must be remarked, the hopes of all had now revived. The mysterious influence had been again exerted, and in a critical moment when they had despaired of it. In a few hours Herbert was much calmer. The colonists could now discuss this incident. The intervention of the stranger was more evident than ever. But how had he been able to penetrate during the night into Granite House? It was inexplicable, and in truth, the proceedings of the genius of the island were not less mysterious than was that genius himself. During this day the sulphate of quinine was administered to Herbert every three hours. The next day some improvement in Herbert's condition was apparent. Certainly he was not out of danger, intermittent fevers being subject to frequent and dangerous relapses, but the most assiduous care was bestowed on him. And besides, the specific was at hand, nor, doubtless, was he who had brought it far distant, and the hearts of all were animated by returning hope. This hope was not disappointed. Ten days after, on the 20th of December, Herbert's convalescence commenced. He was still weak, and strict diet had been imposed upon him, but no access of fever supervened. And then the poor boy submitted with such docility to all the prescriptions ordered him. He longed so to get well. Pencroft was as a man who had been drawn up from the bottom of an abyss. Fits of joy approaching delirium seized him. When the time for the third attack had passed by, he nearly suffocated the reporter in his embrace. Since then he always called him Dr. Spillett. The real doctor, however, remained undiscovered. "'We will find him,' repeated the sailor. Certainly this man, whoever he was, might expect a somewhat too energetic embrace from the worthy Pencroft. The month of December ended, and with it the year 1867, during which the colonists of Lincoln Island had of late been so severely tried. They commenced the year 1868 with magnificent weather, great heat, and a tropical temperature, delightfully cooled by the sea breeze. Herbert's recovery progressed, and from his bed, placed near one of the windows of Granite House, he could inhale the fresh air charged with ozone, which could not fail to restore his health. His appetite returned, and what numberless delicate, savory little dishes Ned prepared for him! "'It is enough to make one wish to have a fever oneself,' said Pencroft. During all this time the convicts did not once appear to, in the vicinity of Granite House. There was no news of Ayrton, and though the engineer and Herbert still had some hopes of finding him again, their companions did not doubt but that the unfortunate man had perished. However, this uncertainty could not last, and when once the lad should have recovered, the expedition, the result of which must be so important, would be undertaken. But they would have to wait a month, perhaps, for all the strength of the colony must be put into requisition to obtain satisfaction from the convicts. However, Herbert's convalescence progressed rapidly. The congestion of the liver had disappeared, and his wounds might be considered completely healed. During the month of January, important work was done on the plateau of Prospect Heights, but it consisted solely in saving as much as was possible from the devastated crops, either of corn or vegetables. The grain and the plants were gathered, 
so as to provide a new harvest for the approaching half-season. With regard to rebuilding the poultry wall, yard, or stables, Cyrus Harding preferred to wait. While he and his companions were in pursuit of the convicts, the latter might very probably pay another visit to the plateau, and it would be useless to give them an opportunity of recommencing their work of destruction. When the island should be cleared of these miscreants, they would set about rebuilding. The young convalescent began to get up in the second week of January at first for one hour a day, then two, then three. His strength visibly returned, so vigorous was his constitution. He was now eighteen years of age. He was tall, and promised to become a man of noble and commanding presence. From this time his recovery, while still requiring care, and Dr. Spillett was very strict, made rapid progress. Towards the end of the month, Herbert was already walking about on Prospect Heights and the beach. He derived from several sea baths, which he took in company with Pencroft and Neb, the greatest possible benefit. Cyrus Harding thought he might now settle the day for their departure, for which the 15th of February was fixed. The nights, very clear at this time of year, would be favorable to the researches they intended to make all over the island. The necessary preparations for this exploration were now commenced, and were important, for the colonists had sworn not to return to Granite House until their twofold object had been achieved. On the one hand, to exterminate the convicts, and rescue Ayrton if he was still living. On the other, to discover who it was that presided so effectually over the fortunes of the colony. Of Lincoln Island, the settlers knew thoroughly all the eastern coast from Claw Cape to the Mandible Capes, the extensive Tadorn Marsh, the neighborhood of Lake Grant, Jackamar Wood, between the road to the Corral and the Mercy, the courses of the Mercy and Red Creek, and lastly the spurs of Mount Franklin, among which the Corral had been established. They had explored, though only in an imperfect manner, the vast shore of Washington Bay from Claw Cape to Reptile End, the woody and marshy border of the west coast, and the interminable downs, ending at the open mouth of Shark Gulf. But they had in no way surveyed the woods which covered the Serpentine Peninsula, all to the right of the Mercy, the left bank of the Falls River, and the wilderness of spurs and valleys which supported three-quarters of the base of Mount Franklin, to the east, the north, and the west, and where doubtless many secret retreats existed. Consequently, many millions of acres of the island had still escaped their investigations. It was, therefore, decided that the expedition should be carried through the far west, so as to include all that region situated on the right of the Mercy. It might perhaps be better worth while to go direct to the corral, where it might be supposed that the convicts had again taken refuge, either to pillage or to establish themselves there. But either the devastation of the corral would have been an accomplished fact by this time, and it would be too late to prevent it, or it had been the convicts' interest to entrench themselves there, and there would be still time to go and turn them out on their return. Therefore, after some discussion, the first plan was adhered to, and the settlers resolved to proceed through the wood to Reptile End. They would make their way with their hatchets, and thus lay the first draft of a road which would place Granite House in communication with the end of the peninsula for a length of from sixteen to seventeen miles. The cart was in good condition. The onagers, well rested, could go a long journey. Provisions, camp effects, a portable stove, and various utensils were packed in the cart as also weapons and ammunition, carefully chosen from the now complete arsenal of Granite House. But it was necessary to remember that the convicts were, perhaps, roaming about the woods, and then in the midst of these thick forests a shot might quickly be fired and received. It was therefore resolved that the little band of settlers should remain together and not separate under any pretext whatever. It was also decided that no one should remain at Granite House. Top and Jup themselves were to accompany the expedition, the inaccessible dwelling needing no guard. 
The fourteenth of February, eve of the departure, was consecrated entirely to repose, and thanksgiving addressed by the colonists to the Creator. A place in the cart was reserved for Herbert, who, though thoroughly convalescent, was still a little weak. The next morning, at daybreak, Cyrus Harding took the necessary measures to protect Granite House from any invasion. The ladders, which were formerly used for the ascent, were brought to the chimneys and buried deep in the sand, so that they might be available on the return of the colonists, for the machinery of the lift had been taken to pieces, and nothing of the apparatus remained. Pencroft stayed the last in Granite House in order to finish this work, and he then lowered himself down by means of a double rope held below, and which, when once hauled down, left no communication between the upper landing and the beach. The weather was magnificent. "'We shall have a warm day of it,' said the reporter, laughing. "'Pooh, Dr. Spilett,' answered Pencroft. "'We shall walk under the shade of the trees and shan't even see the sun.' "'Forward,' said the engineer. The cart was waiting on the beach before the chimneys. The reporter made Herbert take his place in it during the first hours, at least, of the journey, and the lad was obliged to submit to his doctor's orders. Neb placed himself at the onagers' heads. Cyrus Harding, the reporter, and the sailor walked in front. Top bounded joyfully along. Herbert offered a seat in his vehicle to Jupe, who accepted it without ceremony. The moment for departure had arrived, and the little band set out. The cart first turned the angle of the mouth of the Mercy, then, having ascended the left bank for a mile, crossed the bridge, at the other side of which commenced the road to Port Balloon, and there the explorers, leaving this road on their left, entered the cover of the immense woods which formed the region of the far west. For the first two miles the widely scattered trees allowed the cart to pass with ease. From time to time it became necessary to cut away a few creepers and bushes, but no serious obstacle impeded the progress of the colonists. The thick foliage of the trees threw a grateful shade on the ground. Deodars, Douglas firs, Casuarinas, Banksias, gum trees, dragon trees, and other well-known species succeeded each other far as the eye could reach. The feathered tribes of the island were all represented, grouse, jacamars, pheasants, lories, as well as the chattering cockatoos, parrots, and parakeets. Agoutis, kangaroos, and capybaras fled swiftly at their approach, and all this reminded the settlers of the first excursions they had made on their arrival at the island. Nevertheless, observed Cyrus Harding, I notice that these creatures, both birds and quadrupeds, are more timid than formerly. These woods have therefore been recently traversed by the convicts, and we shall certainly find some traces of them. And in fact in several places they could distinguish traces, more or less recent, of the passage of a band of men. Here branches broken off the trees, perhaps to mark out the way, there the ashes of a fire, and footprints in clayey spots, but nothing which appeared to belong to a settled encampment. The engineer had recommended his companions to refrain from hunting. The reports of the firearms might give the alarm to the convicts, who were perhaps roaming through the forest. Moreover, the hunters would necessarily ramble some distance from the cart, which it was dangerous to leave unguarded. In the after part of the day, when about six miles from Granite House, their progress became much more difficult. In order to make their way through some thickets, they were obliged to cut down trees. Before entering such places, Harding was careful to send in Top and Jupe, who faithfully accomplished their commission, and when the dog and orang returned without giving any warning, there was evidently nothing to fear, either from convicts or wild beasts, two varieties of the animal kingdom, whose ferocious instincts placed them on the same level. On the evening of the first day, the colonists encamped about nine miles from Granite House, on the border of a little stream falling into the Mercy, and of the existence of which they had till then been ignorant. 
It evidently, however, belonged to the hydrographical system to which the soil owed its astonishing fertility. The settlers made a hearty meal, for their appetites were sharpened, and measures were then taken that the night might be passed in safety. If the engineer had had only to deal with wild beasts, jaguars or others, he would have simply lighted fires all around his camp, which would have sufficed for its defense. But the convicts would be rather attracted than terrified by the flames, and it was, therefore, better to be surrounded by the profound darkness of night. The watch was, however, carefully organized. Two of the settlers were to watch together, and every two hours it was agreed that they should be relieved by their comrades. And so, notwithstanding his wish to the contrary, Herbert was exempted from guard. Pencroft and Gideon Spilett in one party, the engineer and Neb in another, mounted guard in turns over the camp. The night, however, was but a few hours. The darkness was due rather to the thickness of the foliage than to the disappearance of the sun. The silence was scarcely disturbed by the howling of jaguars and the chattering of the monkeys, the latter appearing to particularly irritate Master Jupe. The night passed without incident, and on the next day, the 15th of February, the journey through the forest, tedious rather than difficult, was continued. This day they could not accomplish more than six miles, for every moment they were obliged to cut a road with their hatchets. Like true settlers, the colonists spared the largest and most beautiful trees, which would besides have cost immense labor to fell and the small ones only were sacrificed. But the result was that the road took a very winding direction, and lengthened itself by numerous detours. During the day, Herbert discovered several new specimens not before met with in the island, such as the tree-fern, with its leaves spread out like the waters of a fountain, locust-trees, on the long pods of which the onagers browsed greedily, and which supplied a sweet pulp of excellent flavor. There, too, the colonists again found groups of magnificent quarries, their cylindrical trunks, crowned by a cone of verdure, rising to a height of two hundred feet. These were the tree kings of New Zealand, as celebrated as the cedars of Lebanon. As to the fauna, there was no addition to those species already known to the hunters. However, they saw, though unable to get near them, a couple of those large birds peculiar to Australia, a sort of cassowary, called emu, five feet in height and with brown plumage, which belonged to the tribe of waders. Top darted after them as fast as his four legs could carry him, but the emus distanced him with ease, so prodigious was their speed. As to the traces left by the convicts, a few more were discovered. Some footprints found near an apparently recently extinguished fire were attentively examined by the settlers. By measuring them one after the other, according to their length and breadth, the marks of five men's feet were easily distinguished. The five convicts had evidently camped on this spot, but, and this was the object of so minute an examination, a sixth footprint could not be discovered, which in that case would have been that of Ayrton. Ayrton was not with them, said Herbert. No, answered Pencroft, and if he was not with them, it was because the wretches had already murdered him. But then these rascals have not a den to which they may be tracked like tigers. No, said the reporter, it is more probable that they wander at random and it is their interest to rove about until the time when they will be masters of the island. "'The masters of the island!' exclaimed the sailor. "'The masters of the island!' he repeated, and his voice was choked, as if his throat was seized in an iron grasp. Then, in a calmer tone, "'Do you know, Captain Harding,' said he, "'what the ball is which I have rammed into my gun?' "'No, Pencroft.' It is the ball that went through Herbert's chest, and I promise you it won't miss its mark. But this just retaliation would not bring Ayrton back to life, and from the examination of the footprints left in the ground, they must, alas, 
conclude that all hopes of ever seeing him again must be abandoned. That evening they encamped fourteen miles from Granite House, and Cyrus Harding calculated that they could not be more than five miles from Reptile Point. And indeed, the next day the extremity of the peninsula was reached, and the whole length of the forest had been traversed, but there was nothing to indicate the retreat in which the convicts had taken refuge, nor that, no less secret, which sheltered the mysterious unknown. End of chapter.